Punky, an editor with Becker's Healthcare. The program will begin with a presentation and we will have a question and answer session following the completion of the presentation. You can submit any questions you have throughout the presentation by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. Our presenters will attempt to answer as many questions as she can during the time we have and will follow up on questions she does not have the opportunity to address. You will receive an email within about a week following the webinar that will include instructions for how you can download a copy of the presentation. You will also receive a follow-up email shortly after completion of the program where you can submit your feedback or any additional questions at that time, but that email will not include the presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Lynn White, who is a practicing anesthesiologist in Colorado. She received her medical degree from the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health and has also worked as a pediatric emergency room doctor. A physician who has practiced medicine in critical care settings for many years, Dr. White is president and CEO of Patient Shield Concepts, a company dedicated to the prevention of infections. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Dr. White to begin today's presentation. I'd like to thank everyone for participating and welcome to the webinar. Before we get started, I would like to uh, start with a few questions for the audience. But before I do that, I'd like to just say that I founded uh, Patient Shield Concepts on the premise that everyone who's involved in healthcare should be more vigilant about uh, prevention of infection and cross contamination. So that was the basis for producing the suction shield, which is a container basically for contaminated suction is instruments so that we do not cross-contaminate patients in the uh, patient care environment. Now, uh, next slide, please. Oh, can we go back to the slide? Next slide, please. Okay, so let's... Let's uh, uh, turn to the first question, which is basically um, these four um, HAIs account for what percent of HAIs in the acute care setting? We're talking about catheter-associated urinary tract infections, surgical site infections, bloodstream infections, and pneumonia. A, 90%, B, 10%, C, 75%, D, none of the above. Please submit your answer. Next page, please. All right, uh, according to our poll results, we have uh, people responding at 90% uh, for the most of the audience. And the fact of the matter is that actually those infections account for 75% of infections that we see in the hospitals. Next question. HAIs rank blank among most common medical errors, and we're talking about healthcare associated complications. A, fourth, B, first, C, fifth, D, second, E, none of the above. Please uh, submit your answer. All right. We have uh, most people coming in at second, which is 44% of the people polled, and that is correct. Next slide, please. HAIs rank blank with respect to annual cost of medical errors. Uh, fourth, first, second, third, or none of the above. Please submit your answer. All right, our poll results show that um, most people thought that, uh, that HIIs rank first. They actually rank second with respect to annual cost of medical errors. Next, next question. Which HAI class occurs most frequently in hospitals? Surgical site infections, catheter-associated urinary tract infections, central line infections, ventilator-associated pneumonia, or C. difficile? Please uh, submit your answer. All right. Our audience selected urinary tract infections, which is absolutely correct. That is the most common HAI class in hospitals. Next slide, please. 
which category of HAI incurs the most direct costs per case? Urinary tract infections, bloodstream infections, C. difficile, surgical site infections, or ventilator-associated pneumonia? Please submit your answer. It looks like our audience selected bloodstream infections most commonly, which is absolutely correct. Next slide, please. This cartoon is to remind us why we're here today. We are certainly not the perpetrators of cross-contamination infection. Rather, we have multiple organisms that are the perpetrators, but we are going to try to get to the bottom of how it is that we keep having the numbers of hospital infections that we have. Next slide, please. Let's review the full scope of the problem. Next slide, please. In the United States, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention tell us that we have about 1.7 million HAIs annually in acute care hospitals, with an incidence of 1 in 20 patients admitted, resulting in about 100,000 patient deaths per year. This is, by most health by most health authorities, this is considered to be an underestimate. It also excludes 26,000 U.S. facilities that are non-acute care hospitals, such as ambulatory surgery centers, skilled nursing facilities, long-term care facilities, hospice and dialysis centers, in which we know there are at least 3 million HAIs a year, and we have about 380,000 deaths accounted for in those particular centers. Next slide, please. And the reason that we do not have the accurate numbers are that physicians are underreporting, not necessarily on purpose, but because HAIs can appear after discharge from the hospital. And the readmission re 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 rates for HAIs are underestimated as well. Let's give an example. In the patients with coronary bypass, there is a 1 to 34 ratio of, of, of the mediastinitis mediastinitis patients reported in the hospital versus after discharge and treated in outpatient clinics. Clearly, these were HAIs but not reported as such. Additionally, if the HAI is not reported but is treated after discharge to home or to another facility, it also underestimates the readmission rate for an HAC, a hospital-acquired complication, since it was not reported as such during the hospitalization. Next slide, please. Let's Talk about direct medical costs. Next slide, please. In the United States, the direct medical costs have been estimated by several accounting type of articles. In the first article by Zimlichman, there was an estimated excess medical cost from HAIs of $10 billion. And this is accounting done without any cost shifting to private payers. If you look at uh, articles that include cost shifting, the estimates are 35 to $45 billion a year for acute care hospitals annually and for 28, 28, 28 to $33 billion for non-acute care hospitals annually. And this is with including cost shifting to payers. Next slide, please. If you look at this article by Marchetti and Rossiter, which is quoted down below, You'll see that the total direct, indirect, and non-medical social cost estimate is actually 96 to 147 billion dollars per year. And this includes loss of work and legal costs and other patient factors. Next slide, please. Let's review the components of direct medical costs. Next slide, please. In terms of looking at the commonly encountered infections, 75% of HAIs that we see are from urinary tract infections, bloodstream infections, surgical site infections, and pneumonias. And if you add in C. difficile infections, this accounts for over 90% of the excess medical costs from HAIs. Next slide, please. Of those uh, HAIs that are reimbursed by CMS, you can see that once you take away those that are not reimbursed, we are left with ventilator-associated pneumonias. If you look at uh, the other infections, urinary tract infections, bloodstream infections, and, so, and um, surgical infections, as well as C. difficile and MRSA, 
you'll see that most infections are now not reimbursed by CMS as of 2015. Next slide, please. If you look at the excess cost of an HAI per patient per category, urinary tract infections come in at $1,000 extra, ventilator-associated pneumonias come in at $40,000, surgical site infections about $20,000, bloodstream infections or sepsis at $45,000, C. difficile infections at 11,000. If you take all of these costs and you average them across all admissions to the hospital with or without an HAI, it's basically as if you had a tax of $1,100 per patient admitted to the hospital. Next slide, please. In terms of the overall net profit margins in actual costs to the hospital, a patient with an HAI costs the hospital $5,000 on average. Next slide. If you weigh all the HAIs and average them, you get an average cost of $23,000 per HAI of excess cost to the hospital. Next slide, please. Per infection, an HAI costs a great deal more if a methicillin-resistant Staph aureus infection is involved. For a surgical site infection, it nearly doubles at $42,000. For a bloodstream infection, it increases from $45,000 to $58,500 per infection of excess cost. Next slide, please. The other uh, cost factor is an increased length of stay, which increases bed occupancy without pay. Without an HAI, the average length of stay is five days. With an HAI, it's 22 days. So the length of stay is increased at least two times as much in HAI patients. Next slide, please. By category, if you look at the length of stay increases on average for these uh, various infections, the bloodstream infection adds about 10 days of length of stay, surgical site infections add 11, pneumonias add 13, C. difficile about three days, and if you look at just MRSA infections in the bloodstream infection category, it adds 15.7 days, and a surgical site infection, it adds 23 days for length of stay. Well, according to the CDC, uh, the MRSA comprises about 8% of HAI, so you can see that's a significant number. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The HAI mortality, in terms of the most uh, mortality encountered, is in pneumonias and bloodstream infections. That's the bulk of, of mortalities. The other categories are urinary, urinary tract infections at 13%, surgical site infections at 8%, and others including C. difficile at 11%. Next slide, please. Another slide about HAI costs. The percentage of excess costs in U.S. hospitals by category of HAI, in this slide you can see that bloodstream infections are the most expensive, surgical site infections are next, pneumonias are after that, and C. difficile infections and urinary tract infections cost less but comprise a significant number of hospitalized patients with HAI. Next slide, please. If you look at HAI incidence by category, urinary tract infections are definitely the most common, as you uh, noted in your poll. Surgical site infections are at 17% of HAIs, bloodstream infections 14%, pneumonia 13%, and C. difficile has been steadily climbing and is at 10%. Next slide. The overall mortality from HAIs is 6.5% of patients who have them die from them. Next slide. The increase in mortality from HAIs is 1.5 to 2 times that of patients who do not have an HAI in, in uh, their hospital stay. Next slide. In terms of the intensive care unit, HAIs are far more likely to be encountered there. One of the reasons is that patients who are in the ICU tend to get colonized with more multiple drug resistant organisms every day that they are in the ICU. So they are five to ten times more likely to get an HAI than non-ICU patients. They are also sicker, have less resistance, and we all know this for a fact. Next slide, please. 
in the ICU, about 50 to 70 percent of HAIs are antimicrobial resistant strains and are much more difficult to treat. Next slide, please. The leading cause of death in the ICU is definitely pneumonia. Next slide, please. In terms of the most expensive and most deadly infections that we encounter in the ICU, they are pneumonia and sepsis in both categories. Next slide, please. In the patient population over 65 years old, there is a great deal more vulnerability and they have increased costs in excess uh, dollars to the hospital of 150000 approximately and decreases in lifespan by many years. And these are not factored costs necessarily in what the CDC reports to us. Next slide, please. In patients undergoing invasive surgery, uh, there's a 19.5% mortality in the case of sepsis, as well as an additional $33,000 of cost. Next slide, please. In patients undergoing invasive surgery who encounter pneumonia, there's 11.4% mortality, as well as an additional $46,000 of cost. Next slide. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services penalize underperforming hospitals according to the Accountable Care Act. There's a steady decrement in Medicare reimbursements each year, currently at 1% for the lowest performing quartile of hospitals with the most HAIs. And these will be progressing to a decrement of 2% over the next couple of years. Hospitals with high readmission rates are losing an additional 3% of their Medicare dollars every year. And additional penalties, penalties will be assessed for improper or non-reporting to inpatient quality reporting services, which is also a requirement of the ACA. Next slide, please. In the readmission category, we have our cartoon of the boomerang. And uh, not only the boomerang doesn't feel well, but also the hospitals are facing a great deal of penalty that is uh, causing a great upheaval. Next slide, please. Readmission rates within 30 days are also uh, penalized heavily, as we know, at 3%. Within HAI, the readmission rate is about 30%. Without an HAI, it's about 6%. Next, please, next page. An average chance of readmission within a year in patients who are MRSA positive culture, there's a 40% chance of readmission. And with VRE positive cultures, a 67% chance of readmission within a year. Next slide. The average readmission time from hospital discharge for a culture positive patient is 27 days. Next slide. Let's now look at the indirect costs of HAIs. Next slide. The loss of CMS reimbursement. Uh, when we look at categories of infection, including urinary tract infections, bloodstream infections, surgical site infections, and pneumonias, we are now adding to this category in 2015 MRSA and CD, CDI, C. difficile infections. And these excess costs are no longer being paid by Medicare and Medicaid services. And this accounts for about 60% of the inpatient population. So that's a significant decrement in hospitals. Next slide. In 2014, it was predicted that 2,225 hospitals would lose 227 million in withheld compensation. And uh, that turned out to be quite true. There was up to $1 million lost for a large hospital annually as well as smaller amounts to uh, smaller hospitals. So withheld compensation was significant in 2014. Next slide. In 2015, the penalty increases are predicted to be hardest for the larger hospitals. So 300 bed hospitals with poor uh, HAC prevention performance and high readmission numbers will be expected to lose about $1.3 million annually. Next slide. In 2014, this number was about a million dollars per hospital, 
these were uh, the hardest the hardest hit hospitals were large hospitals, smaller hospitals not as much. Next slide. The realities of the CMS penalties are that uh, the teaching hospitals and the inner city safety net hospitals are hardest hit because they're disproportionately penalized due to the higher patient acuity. The death rates are significant in these hospitals because they're not necessarily uh, the kind of follow-up or, or patient uh, population that would be uh, would included in a, a different kind of hospital setting. Next slide. The ACA and VBP reimbursements, let's go over these. The hospital consumer assessment of healthcare provider systems that we know as HCAP surveys are the centerpiece of value-based purchasing reimbursements. And this is all part of the Affordable Care Act started in 2010. Next slide, please. The 2010 HCAPS patient satisfaction surveys showed that patient satisfaction at that time was linked to the nurse-patient ratios, interdisciplinary collaboration between doctors, nurses, and other paramedical personnel, and the work environment, including cleanliness and noise. Next slide. The HCAPS patient satisfaction studies uh, in 2013 showed that performance was more of a patient factor than previously. So in a pay-for-performance world, this is very important. Next slide. The HCAPS patient satisfaction studies are also factored in now in terms of the, um, the decrements from Medicare and Medicaid services. The patient experience of care comprised about 30% of the score, and the clinical process of care comprises 70% with regard to value-based purchasing. So the HCAPs are still a significant portion of reimbursement. Next slide, please. HCAPs patient satisfaction studies uh, do not necessarily reflect who are the best and worst performers clinically. The reimbursements now are being distributed from the worst performers to the best performers, and HCAPs figure into this uh, ratio. In the first five years, the VBP hospitals, which are general acute care hospitals, risk about $1.88 million each in median revenue, and this is a significant portion of hospitals' revenue, for, uh, as we all know. Next slide. As we know in quality measurement from the uh, patient surveys, the patient assessments are not necessarily linked to the clinical standards of the hospital, and this causes an unnecessary punishment to high volume, high acuity hospitals. Next slide. Patient assessment and HAI re readmissions are also factored in. These also cause unnecessary punishments on high volume hospitals which have greater acuity patients and perhaps patients who are not as good at follow up. Next slide. Let's look at the other indirect cost, which is the reality of a discharge uh, patient with an HAI. Many patients who are discharged with an HAI do not necessarily go home. Many are readmitted are admitted to long term care facilities or skilled nursing facilities. Many require home health care, and many require long-term rehabilitation and pain treatments for painful HAI conditions, and most patients experience an altered quality of life. Next slide, please. The financial impact on families is not a direct cost, but rather an indirect cost, and uh, this is due to prolonged hospitalization and post-discharge disability in these patients. If you look at uh, personal bankruptcies in the United States, 62% of bankruptcies were due to health care issues, and this was from a study in 2007. Next slide. The impact on families is significant in, in terms of these personal bankruptcies. The, the majority of these patients were well-educated, homeowners, middle class, employed, and about 75% were insured. Next slide. This cartoon 
shows us there is another indirect cost to HAIs, and that is the, from the legal community. Next slide, please. In terms of the good news, 70% of HAIs are said to be preventable. In terms of the bad news to hospitals, 70% of HAIs are considered to be preventable, and the lawyers have picked up on this. Next slide. Malpractice legal costs are a significant cost to uh, operations for a hospital. Non-compliance with reporting standards to the government and non-compliance with HAI prevention standards that are well known and well documented are the cause of multi-million dollar malpractice settlements per patient. Next slide. HAI legal costs are not insignificant. 24% of hospital professional liability costs are due to hospital acquired complications. Plus, there's a 1% annual rise in HAI claims that has been tracked. And these all lead to multi-million dollar malpractice settlements. Next slide. In the case of hospitals, when patients encounter an HAI, the hospitals are guilty until proven innocent. It is really the burden of proof on the hospitals instead of on the legal community to make sure that it's documented well, that the patient did not get an HAI in the hospital. Next slide. HAI malpractice cases, uh, hospitals can establish innocence by proving that an infection was not an HAI, and this requires a great deal of sophistication of documentation, which means using standard of care documentation as we've learn from infection professionals. We also have to prove in hospitals that infection was not acquired in the hospital by surveillance. And C, implementing evidence-based medicine practices such as the practices that we currently use for in installing central lines. Uh, those are practices that can help to prevent malpractice cases. Next slide. Let's look at unintended consequences. Next slide. One of the problems that we've encountered by aggressively treating infections is that we now have multiple drug resistant organisms. Admitted patients are very likely to become colonized with resistant organisms, organisms from the hospital, especially in the intensive care unit. Multiple drug resistant organisms are due to antibiotic misuse or even um, misuse in the general community and um, also because patients have horizontal transmission in healthcare facilities from patient to patient, from patient to caregiver to patient. Next slide. The MDROs definitely increase mortality as we've seen in MRSA infections. A MRSA infection versus a, a sensitive strain carries a greater than two times mortality, and the length of stay for a resistant organism is much greater. Next slide. Multiple drug resistant organisms are also responsible for C. difficile mortalities. In the United States, we have 250,000 people who are hospitalized annually because of C. difficile infections, and 14,000 of these currently die. So, C. difficile infection, as we know, is a consequence of antibiotic, especially broad spectrum antibiotic prescribing. Next slide. Multi-drug resistant organisms also lead uh, to infections that are not reimbursable. And for infection professionals, they are focused on the ones that are reimbursed by Medicare and Medicaid and not the ones that are not. So these become lesser priorities and are spreading in hospitals as well. Um, unnecessary tests on newly admitted patients are also an extra cost to hospitals. And inappropriate antibiotic treatments are also responsible for the spread of more multi-drug resistant organisms within the hospital. And they're also responsible for the increases in C. difficile rates. Next slide. HEI containment initiatives. Currently, we have the National Healthcare Safety Network mandatory reporting by states and hospitals in these states. There's the Partnership for Patients campaign, part of the ACA, and uh, hand hygiene measures that are being instituted in most hospitals. 
I'd like to expand on this a little bit. This also is um, part of the measure to reduce eight HAIs, which is bloodstream infections, urinary tract infections, uh, surgical infections, ventilator-associated pneumonias, C. difficile infection, post-op pneumonia, MRSA, and VRE. Next slide. In terms of progress that we've made, one-third of hospitals in the United States are in full compliance with the guidelines that we've uh, elucidated before, but less than 50% of healthcare providers follow basic hand hygiene measures. Next slide. There has been progress according to CDC reports in terms of the infections themselves. In the bloodstream infection category, we've had a decrement of 46% of infections now reported in the past five years. C. difficile has gone down by 10%, MRSA by 8%, surgical site infections by 19%. However, urinary tract infections are going up by 6% per year, and these comprise 50% of the infections. Next slide, please. Let's talk a little bit about HAI prevention. Next slide. We know that HAI prevention works. Central venous catheter insertion protocols are well known to reduce certain, in certain hospitals the rate to zero for bloodstream infections that are device related. Sterile OR settings for urinary catheter insertion are preferred, and these are the places where you see the least number of UTIs. Oral care protocols can prevent ventilator associated pneumonias in some ICUs down to 0%, and these uh, decrease the infected biofilms in the patient's environment. MRSA and VRE patient isolation precautions and barriers are very important in uh, containing the spread of these infections. And we know that hospital infection preventionists are well worth their weight in gold because they definitely reduce infection outbreaks in hospitals and are also responsible for better record keeping and better reimbursements for the hospitals. Next slide. Transmission prevention, let's talk about MDRO spread. Uh, if we want to prevent these, we have to get into hand hygiene monitoring programs, uh, be strict about isolation precautions and environmental hygiene around the patient, active surveillance programs for certain infections like MRSA, decontamination of the patient's environment, in term, including terminal decontamination of the rooms, and vaccination programs for high-risk patients and for the healthcare staff. Next slide, please. Let's talk about transmission prevention in the setting of our devices. Hospitals are not self-regulating to prevent yank or cross-contamination, and this is why we have uh, promulgated the use of a safe place to put suction implements. Next slide. Our solution to this problem is a suction shield. This is a one-piece disposable holster to contain suction implements when, that, when they are not in use. These can help reduce cross-contamination and HAI transmission. They uh, have a reservoir at the bottom to isolate secretions from the tip of the Yankauer tips, and they reduce suction noise. Next slide, please. I would like to open the floor to questions and answers at this point. And I would like to thank the organizers and our panelists and the uh, participating audience. Thank you very much. Yes, and thank you, Dr. White, for that informative and enjoyable presentation. As she mentioned, we will now begin the Q&A portion of the program. As a reminder to our audience, you can submit any questions you have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled Enter a Question for Staff and clicking Send. Dr. White will attempt to answer as many questions as possible during the time we have and will follow up on questions she does not have the opportunity to address. Um, to start, here's one, Dr. White. Um, what are some of the infections you didn't talk about in the presentation? I'd like to elaborate a little bit more about the viral infections that we encounter commonly, especially in pediatric hospitals. As we know, we have uh, several outbreaks that are seasonal and are also terribly expensive when they're spread from room to room. These include rotavirus, respiratory syncytial virus, enteroviruses, and these are epidemics that we see uh, practically every year. Let's not ignore influenza viruses, which are uh, specifically a problem in the very young and the very old. 
and require hospitalization for these populations. Uh, these are some of the things that we're very concerned about in terms of infection spread. In addition, uh, we also are concerned about the hepatitis viruses, which are uh, in the cases of B and A and non-A, non-B and C are uh, bloodborne. And so we are certainly con uh, concerned with the bloodborne spread of infections. Next question, please. Great, thank you. Yes, um, you had mentioned that you make a product called Suction Shield. How can that help me reduce the cost of HAIs? Well, we are trying to contain those infections, including droplet spread infections, uh, anything born in the saliva, and bloodborne infections. As we know, not all suctioning is non bloody, and so uh, we are trying to prevent spread of respiratory viruses, uh, the usual HAI oral infections, and uh, the um, types of infections that we haven't even spoken about, including resistant TB. So we're in the space of trying to prevent cross-contamination between patients and contamination of patients to caregivers as well. Thank you. Great, okay. Um, let's see, another question from the audience. You outlined so many problems caused by HIIs. What can we do to combat the huge problem? I think that what we have to do is break it down to each caregiver. All of us are responsible for a patient's well-being from the time that they enter an acute care hospital. If all of us are willing to look at our own practices and where we can do better, I think that we need to look at those. Everyone from housekeeping to the um, attending physician in the ICU is responsible for the spread of these infections. So I've looked at the anesthesia space and in trying to uh, reduce infection and suctioning. I think it's up to every caregiver in the hospital, not just the infection preventionist, to look at their practices, examine them carefully, and say, this is where I can do better. Thank you. Great. OK. We've got another question about the suction shield. Um, how frequently should the suction shield be changed? And are they able to be reprocessed and used more than one time? These are all very good questions. The suction shield should um, be thrown away after 24 hours, especially in the uh, inpatient setting, ICU, or other respiratory areas. In terms of uh, the operating room, where patients are not transferred to inpatient facilities, but are rather uh, outpatient uh, settings, they should be thrown away after each patient. They are single patient use only. And what was the last part of your question? Um, it was, can they be reprocessed? Yes, uh, they, the, they are not reprocessed, but they are recyclable materials. So the entire suction shield is something that can be recycled. Next question, please. Great, definitely. Let me sort through here to come up with one here. Um, Here's one. How do viruses affect the problems of HACs? Uh, viruses are oftentimes ignored in terms of the cost. We know that there's a great deal of excess cost. For example, if an infant is um, hospitalized with a respiratory virus, uh, such as RSV, and this is, this is spread by the caregivers into other units of the hospital, um, this can result in a much greater length of stay. Any length of stay is an extra cost to the hospital. There are, there are several um, of these viruses that I've talked about that have been largely ignored because of the um, attention that the infectious, infection preventionist has to pay to the HAIs that are not reimbursed by Medicare and Medicaid. Next question. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, here's one. You mentioned that HAIs are underreported. Why would hospitals be motivated to report an HAI if they would be so financially impacted by them? Well, for one thing, they are obligated to report them. Uh, this is a requirement now in, uh, in all states. The, uh, the disincentive to report is understandable, but I think that um, the hospitals have to look at more closely at this because if they, if they don't report them then, the, the patients will be readmitted, most likely, within 30 days, and that carries a greater penalty. 
So I think that the, the acknowledgement of the HAI is important in that uh, the hospital become more aware of its practices, institute better practices, hire infection preventionists, and in the long run, they will be saving costs. Next question. Definitely, thank you. Let me look at these. I'm sorry, I am just trying to sort through here. Um, do you think the hand sanitizers at the door of each bed is helping to reduce HAIs, or do you think they would help cause more mutation? That's a very good question as well. I think that the hand sanitizers are a good reminder to be clean in, clean out, which is a program that's been instituted in best practice hospitals. I think that um, that uh, the hand sanitizers, especially if there's a monitor on the floor watching people going in and out of patient rooms is very effective. As I said before, about less than 50% of nurses and doctors are actually following these protocols of clean in, clean out. Um, so I think that a, a reminder at the door is a very good thing to do. Uh, we know that hands that are grossly soiled need to be washed with soap and water instead of these alcohol-based soaps at the door but uh, these are very useful. The other problem with alcohol-based soaps is that C. difficile is not, um, is not sensitive to these, so C. diff patients do require washing with soap and water uh, before and after patient contacts. Great insight, okay. Got another question here. What role does daily and terminal cleaning play in reducing HAIs? We know that uh, biofilms are formed in the patient's environment all the time and that organisms stay alive a very, very long time. Uh, for MRSA, we have a range of seven days to seven months, so that's a very scary prospect. Uh, terminal cleaning is very important in keeping these biofilms down and it also it protects not just the patient but the visitors and the caregivers as well. And the caregivers go from room to room and biofilms can cling to their clothing. So we know that uh, the cleaning is, is essential every day. Thank you. Great, okay. Um, got another one. What practices should practitioners employ to avoid legal liability? I think that documentation is very important. Uh, the best practices hospitals have infection preventionists who require a certain amount of documentation regarding um, the surveillance that is done as well as documentation of uh, whether or not the patient actually had the, received the infection in the hospital. Um, so those are very important things that they need to do in order to establish liability. They also um, need to keep track of their infections so that they can track themselves from year to year to see which practices are actually working, which standards of practice are actually working, such as the practices for central line infections, and practices for urinary tract infections. So that way they have an idea of what is actually effective and what is not. Next question. Sure thing. Let me sort through here, Dr. White. My apologies. Let me see. I'm sorry. OK. Um, here we go. How are medical students and residents being educated on infection control and aseptic techniques? Um, the cardiology resident at a leading medical school was going to use the scissors from a nurse's pocket to remove the sutures on a central line for my husband until I insisted that he wash his hands, establish a sterile field, and use a suture removal kit. Well, that's uh, horrifying, but not uncommon. Um, I would like to address that. It's a really good question. Uh, the resident should have had supervision. Uh, of course, not all of them do, but uh, that's just an outrageous practice. Naturally, you're correct about that. Um, what medical students and residents are being taught to do is uh, best medical practices in university hospitals, such as clean in, clean, in, clean out. The infection preventionists are also on top of this in terms of making sure that best practices are followed by the trainees as well as the practitioners. So I think that uh, the infection preventionist I can't um, overemphasize how important they are in the hospitals by um, 
trying to enforce all of these protocols that we have, especially for things like central line infections, um, hand sanitation, and uh, placement of devices. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, with that, I think we're going to wrap up the Q&A portion of today. I would like to thank Dr. White for the excellent presentation and thank our audience for participating. We look forward to having you join us for future webinars. This concludes today's program. Have a wonderful afternoon.